insurance because they cannot find, even the senior building they going up on rent. $20, that's too much. And you on a fixed income, we got to pass in the bill 125. We could do it, that's the solution. If Alabama could get it, Georgia could get it also. On this day after crossover at the Capitol, some people who didn't see their cause advance continued to push for their voices to be heard. Welcome to Lawmakers. On this day 29 of the Georgia Legislative Session, I'm Donna Lowry in Atlanta. Highlights from yesterday's long day coming up. In the studio, a legislator joins us to talk about his bill to make sure cities and counties enforce bans on public camping or sleeping by homeless people. On another issue, you may not realize that a good chunk of money going into the Georgia Lottery for Education Fund comes from something that doesn't involve mega millions, scratch offs, or other traditional lottery games. They're called non cash redemption gift cards, and last year they brought in $147 million. What exactly are they and what may be ahead? We'll hear from the sponsor of the legislation that passed in the House last night. We'll also hear from a lawmaker who wants the state to help grow minority and small businesses. And he'll talk about the Georgia Promise Scholarship or what some call the voucher bill approved by the Senate. First, let's head to Capitol correspondent Rochelle Ritchie. Well, hi, Donna. A late night for members in both chambers. The House not adjourning until after midnight. Now, several bills did meet the deadline for crossover day and some surprising upsets in the Senate. One surprise upset for those betting on sports betting legislation with neither chamber passing bills related to gambling. In the House, HB 181 passed and will restrict the sale of products made from a South Asian plant called Kratom, which has proven deadly. We had uh, two cases back home where one uh, got on, hooked on Kratom and eventually committed suicide. Another young man got on Kratom, was through a halfway house where he was going in there because of opioids. Once he got hooked on Kratom, unfortunately, he developed psychotic behaviors, eventually wound up in a mental health institution. Kratom causes effects similar to opioids and was found in products sold in Georgia. The previous form of the bill banned Kratom in its entirety, but this bill will allow for Georgians 21 and up to purchase Kratom products that must be kept behind a counter. This is the first bill introduced. It passed 171 to 3. Also passing in the House, HB 189 would address the maximum truck weight allowed in Georgia. Proponents of the bill say its support is vital for the trucking industry to maintain the supply chain. What we are doing here is we're actually reducing uh, current weight limit from 95,000 currently being run on our roads to a uh, a variance, an 80,000 pound variant, an 80,000 pound with a 10% variance of 88,000. One thing that we heard from uh, feed mills in Madison to um, a logger in middle Georgia is that, you know, with additional weight limit, uh, they are able to carry additional feed to farm uh, to where it may be a delivery every seven days versus every nine days. Uh, we've heard testimony from um, loggers that he was actually able with an increase in weight to um, uh, save $72 per trip and ladies and gentlemen uh, with the tight margins in production all across the board today $72 is significant whenever you're talking about uh, moving freight around. But members who oppose the bill fear roads and bridges will be damaged by the heavier loads. The bridges, yes, there are many bridges, and they will not have to go around right now, but they will in the future when they're damaged. That means school buses will be rerouted, other traffic will have to go another way. In rural Georgia, in case you don't know, sometimes it might be 20 miles to the next bridge. This legislature is actively seeking to increase the funding on roads. That's nice. We have a lot of money, don't we? Yes. We have a lot of money that's needed all over this state. Why would we have to supplement an industry? We're famous for picking winners and losers. And in the Senate, the controversial bill, SB 140, which would restrict gender-affirming care for transgender youth and prohibit doctors from prescribing hormone therapy or performing gender-affirming surgeries on transgender people under 18. 
This bill protects children who are struggling with their gender identity, issuing from being pushed into decisions that will alter their bodies forever. Uh, those are irreversible changes that will affect and live with a person for the rest of their lives. Those are significant things that we cannot discount by any means. But let me just say, w what we've tried to do is strike a really good balance. We did leave in the puberty blocking agents, which will give what is termed as a mental pause and allowing them to continue with uh, mental health therapy uh, that does not do irreversible charges, changes. As a matter of fact, when you stop the puberty blockers in about 18 months, you go through puberty. Democrats argue the bill takes away medical treatment and offers nothing in return. For Senator Sally Harrell, the mother of a transgender son, the bill is personal. Those years when I raised my children were really happy years. I really loved having a boy and a girl. And I watched my daughter grow up into a beautiful young woman. Then at age 15, she told me she thought she might be a boy. And nothing in my life prepared me for that moment. The problem I have with this bill is that it only addresses what we won't do for our children. Instead, I really feel like what we need to focus on is what we can do for these kids. Despite objections, SB 140 passed 33 to 22. And today, after their long night, the House took up first readers and called it a day. But the Senate, who had an earlier evening, tackled two bills, one dealing with new tax code and one that helps support women during pregnancy. House Bill 129 expands TANF, more commonly known as welfare for expectant mothers and their families. Expanding eligibility to pregnant women would continue to build on the steps Georgia's taken to improve maternal health for low-income populations, such as extending Medicaid postpartum coverage to 12 months. Both bills were passed. And the House did not debate any sports betting legislation. Speaker John Byrne saying that this just wasn't the year for it. However, language to legalize sports betting could be amended into another bill that did cross over. That is my Capitol Report. Donna, back to you. We're going to talk now about banning homeless encampments, growing minority businesses, and more. And joining me are Republican Senator Cardin Summers of Cordell, who is chairman of the Committee on Banking and Financial Institutions, and Democratic Senator Derek Mallow of Savannah, who is now in the Senate after a term in the House. Welcome to lawmakers to both of you. Thanks so much for being here. I'm going to start with you. Uh, chairman Summers, your, your bill dealing with homeless encampments in particular passed in the Senate. Tell us what the bill does. Well, as you know, we started this bill about three years ago, <clears throat> and we worked down from a ream of paper down to about three sheets. And basically what we're trying to do is create something, to, a pathway to help with homeless. That's, that's what it was designed to do, to help with homeless. Um, we took out one section of the bill at the very end of the bill regarding lawsuits, et cetera, et cetera, that a, that a person could file back to a city or wherever. But homelessness affects 159 counties. It's not indigenous to Atlanta. And what the bill basically does is it, it starts giving some parameters of how cities and counties have to deal with laws already in place. We didn't create any new laws. We just simply said, you must enforce your street camping ban. There, these laws are already in place. No new laws were created. And then the big crux of the bill was the fact that we created, and it was <clears throat> Senator Davenport, uh, one of my uh, colleagues that was on the, one of our set, homeless study committees during the summer, said so we need to have an audit of, of for all these hundreds of millions of dollars that come into the state goes to in regards to all these 5013 c programs out there so people will know or at least we'll be able to find out are they spending the money for the homeless and that was basically the bill very simple yeah very simple a lot of support including you you yeah. supported it yeah. why did you support it i supported uh senator summer's bill after we removed the 
piece of the bill that allowed for individuals to bring suits against cities, municipalities, county governments, because I felt that that would backlog our already burdened criminal justice system with frivolous lawsuits. And so the main thing that we both agree on is that we want to find out where the money is being spent. As a lawmaker, I want to give an account for all public dollars, and I supported the bill because we're going to find out if people are using the money as they say they're using it, and we'll get a report from the state auditor to let us know if there's fraud, waste, uh, or if we need to do something about it. Okay, so we want to switch gears to something that you are passionate about and that you're pushing, that the state grow minority businesses. Talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. Um, last year, the state did less than 1% of all contracts that came out from the state to a minority business in the state. And I often hear that Georgia is the number one state to do business. We have done great economic development in this state. Uh, economic development is showing up down I-16 in my portion of the state, and that's important. But what good is it if you're going to bring all this economic development and bring big corporations outside the state of Georgia to come and do all the work? We need to be focused on growing the talent we have in Georgia, helping those small businesses to grow into large businesses. One contract could change the life of one business, but the problem is, is these small businesses can't get bonded on these big projects. They can't get bonded on a million and five, ten million dollar project because they're small. They need contracts broken up to get them a start. That's what we need to be focused on in this state. We don't need to be worried about recruiting everybody to come to the state. We need to help grow people in this state. So no bill on that right now, but something you're working on maybe for next year. The, the governor's office did something with the administrative office on how contracts are awarded. Uh, some of that comes out of the executive branch and the economic <laughs> development department and the straight and the state development authorities is really uh, more of a push that we need to be inquiring and asking these questions of our development authorities are they doing this we need to ask the governor to be supportive of this we need to ask the state economic De development agency to be having these tough conversations because if we don't ask nobody will do it okay I want to talk about something you guys might disagree a little bit on and that is the promise scholarship that some, I think you call it a voucher, it's a promise scholarship, your feelings on it, $6,000 that parents can use to put their children in home schools, private schools, virtual schools, or for tutoring. Well, quickly, I supported the bill when we dropped it down. You know, used to, George used to call it D and F schools. Now they call it the lower 25% schools. I support the bill when we, when we took that part and put it in and put that into the bill because I, obviously if if you feel that your child is in a school that's that's a failing school, you should have the right to to send your child somewhere else. Uh, those people still pay taxes in that county though. They pay taxes in that city. So it's not like we're taking all the monies away from public schools. It is 6,000. This greatly lowered the amount of money that will go into it. Okay. You, how do you feel about it? You voted against it. Absolutely. The $6,000, if you look at the weight in the QBE formula, the $6,000 is way above what we pay for kindergarten, grades one through three. In fact, that dollar amount comes from the amount we spend on special education uh, when you look at the weight in the QBE formula. So in reality, we're taking away more money from local school districts than they already get appropriated in the QBE formula. Not to mention, we haven't funded transportation in this state. Uh, we haven't done that since Democrats were in control. Uh, add money to transportation. We haven't made kindergarten mandatory. We haven't taken pre-K off the lottery program. So yeah, we got problems in education, but we haven't done the basic steps to fix education. And the bill passed in the Senate. We'll see how it does in the House. I want to talk about an, another one and your, your bill that uh, Rochelle talked a little bit earlier about, and that's Senate Bill 140, restricting surgical treatment for gender dysphoria. Talk about that, why you went for this. Okay. There's no perfect bill out there, okay? I can assure you of that. At least I've never seen one. But Senate Bill 140 is not the monster that people describe it as. We're trying to, to take children that are under the age of 18 years old and give them a pause in their life to decide what they truly want to be when they mature. Because if you have these gender surgeries before, well, if you have a gender surgery period, it's irreversible. It's, that's it, it's done. And children making decisions at 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, in my opinion, and other people's opinion, it, it gives them a chance to think about it before they make that decision. After 18, as far as I'm concerned, you're an adult, Whatever you want to become, you can become. But that would give that gives the pause. That's what Senate Bill 140. As you heard earlier, I was spoken. Dr. Watson spoke. We're we're allowing you know the the, the puberty blockers, and those are fine. We're just not allowing the hormone treatments that, that are irreversible. Hormone treatments are irreversible. Puberty blockers. Your body goes back to what it normally was in roughly 30 to 45 days after you get off the puberty blockers. And that's what the gist of 140. 
And I mean, we're not trying to, we're not against any transgender, any acronyms out there, anything. It was just the fact to give a pause to a, for a person under 18 years old to make that decision as they get a little older and a little bit more comfortable with their body. Okay. You voted against it. Well, it's a very simple <laughs> issue for me. <clears throat> the doctor's office is too small for it to be a parent, their child, and the state of Georgia. And it's just simple. It's, it's too small of a room for the state of Georgia to be in that room. So what we ought to do is give folks a right to privacy, let families make their own medical decisions, and get out of the business of trying to legislate everything in this state. We try to legislate a heck of a lot in, in Georgia. And honestly, those decisions are personal and private and should be left to that family to make that decision. Okay. It passed in the Senate. How are you feeling about it in the House? Well, I certainly hope it, it, it makes it through the House. I, I'm sure, as all bills do, there'll be riders attached to it and other things attached to it, take, things taken out of it. But, you know, the general gist of the bill is simply to, to, quote, quote, protect children. Okay, so we'll continue to follow it. I want to thank you both for coming on. Yeah. I appreciate that. Coming up, a look at why sports betting and all other gambling bills did not pass either chamber, and what's the latest on medical cannabis, the commission, coming up. It's made possible by Georgia Farm Bureau. With over 80 years of helping everyone understand the importance of agriculture in our state. After all, ag is Georgia's number one industry. Food and fiber production represents over 74 billion in output of Georgia's strong economy. The Georgia Farm Bureau legislative team works to represent producers across Georgia at the state capitol during the session and year round. Georgia Farm Bureau, the voice of Georgia farmers. Here's what's new this month with Passport. Kirsten had a lot of courage. She fought for black culture. They could have killed you. You're exactly what we need right now. Oh my God. What is this? She was poisoned. These and all your favorite shows are available with Passport. Support your PBS station and stream more with Passport on the PBS app. We care about things that affect the lives of every American. We are there at the front line to get to the heart of what really matters in every issue. This country has not seen this in 80 years. This extraordinary moment in American history. You're making such a huge impact. Trust is at the heart of what we do. One of the easiest ways to support GPB is to become a monthly GPB sustainer. Your monthly support continues automatically month after month and supports not only the great programming that you love on GPB, but also our efforts in the community. GPB is committed to provide a trusted space for lifelong learning on the air, digitally and in person all across Georgia. All this is made possible with your monthly support. And we can't do it without you, so please donate right now at gpb.org slash give, and thanks. Welcome back to Lawmakers. I'm Donna Lowry. The state is still struggling to shore up the medical cannabis business and fix some of the problems. Earlier today, I spoke to Republican Representative Alan Powell about his bill to improve things. But first, we talked about his legislation passed in the House that focuses on coin-operated games to use elsewhere. But Powell's bill would allow you to get a non-cash gift card. The Lottery Commission that oversees the coin and coin operated amusement industry, they've had a pilot program for the last two years. Uh, to me, it started out as a way that we could ensure that uh, a lot of the locations where these machines are don't pay out cash. But since now they're tethered to the lottery, we know what's going on with them. And this is what this gift card does it is a non cash redeemable gift card. So the people that play these machines, that it'll go back onto the machine or go back onto the card, and they can use those cards to purchase anything, that any, that any, anything that's lawful, quite frankly, and go anywhere, but they're programmed so they cannot be redeemed for cash. The main thing is people always have to go and shop within the particular company. This they, takes away that, right? They can go anywhere. Somebody plays those games and they win points or whatever, then they can take it to Longhorns or Home Depot or wherever they want to go. And this is, apparently, they're everywhere, right? You're saying that they're in bars, they're in restaurants, they're... they're... These machines are everywhere. It's, it's recreational. 
And, you know, of course, it amazes me. I don't play them. But, you know, well, there's two types. Class A, which is the pool tables or the claw machines or the recreational. The other, the Class B, and these are the game machines you win points with. And, you know, people like them, which I had said, I think I said from the well last night, that people like it in lieu of the fact they don't have another way of gambling, which gives me pause to wonder that, you know, in all honesty, we wonder why the uh, polls come back that 70% of Georgians want a right to vote on gambling. Well, this is what they do in lieu of that. So, you know, and the good thing is that the, uh, the lottery is a beneficiary. These, uh, these machines are the closest, the revenues that come off of these co-am machines are the highest today, are the highest part of the increase in profits that go into the lottery. How much money are we talking about? We're talking about last year, it was like $147 million that go, this goes to the lottery, to the uh, Hope Scholarship Fund. Let's talk about, briefly, sports betting, didn't, we didn't even see it in the house. What, what do you think happened this year when it comes to sports I betting or any other game? I have told my constituents in some of my uh, newsletters that there is a plague that inhabits this place about taking shortcuts at times. The bills that we had in the house have never gone anywhere because it takes a constitution. It's a right of the people of Georgia to decide what they want, not the legislature. Yeah, getting that two-thirds is tough. Yes. Yeah. Let's change gears a little bit and let's talk about medical cannabis. Yes. Where are you with that bill? I've been outspoken for the last couple of years about the uh, whatever happened to the Cannabis Commission. The Cannabis Commission, in my opinion, that's only my opinion, because we could never see the detailed information. They refused to provide any information because they said that there was a clause in the law that said they didn't have to share information. But we had enough of the pro we had enough of the applicants that came to us with applications, and they and if you looked at them, they did it on a unique grading system, and it was odd and strange to me that what we saw in the committee was that these can uh, these folks, the applicants, they could have had the same answer to a question on the application as the one of the winners did, and one would get five points, one would get zero points. So it was a flawed, in all appearances, it was a flawed system. So the Canvas Commission went ahead and, and a, granted a license to the two class ones, but not the class fours. So right now you have a unique situation that you have a state approved monopoly of two of these companies. It's been proven that cannabis oil can be of help. What got me involved was because some children that had been born with, uh, with conditions of seizures. And I saw this, and when the doctor said that cannabis was an answer, cannabis oil, low THC oil, was an answer to it. My answer to that was that anything that God lets grow natural has got to be better than something made in a laboratory. And I've been committed to getting this thing cleaned up and moving. The bill that we have proposed, it puts the Cannabis Commission under the Administrative Procedures Act and the Opens Records Act so that they will have to show what they are doing to move forward. So now we're going to go back to something Representative Powell and I discuss with my guest, Democratic Representative Billy Mitchell of Stone Mountain. Representative Mitchell, thank you so much for coming on the show. Glad to be here. You've been a longtime proponent of gambling, and some thought, and I think you may have thought, that this was the year that at least sports betting would pass. We saw several bills fail in the Senate. The House never even took up the issue. What are your thoughts on what happened? Yes, you're, you're absolutely right. I thought that this indeed would be the year that, uh, at the very least, online sports betting would pass. It is the least intrusive of all gambling, uh, it, even in, when you include the, the lottery, which, by the way, let me emphasize, is gambling. And as much as uh, it is done online, and many people are doing it as, as we sit here, uh, the uh, online gaming for the Super Bowl, for example, uh, was to the tune of over uh, $2.5 billion with the B dollars. So I did think that this was, would be the year, and, and quite frankly, I'm surprised that it didn't make its way out of the Senate. What happened? I believe we have some uh, members of the Senate, uh, and, and clearly a majority of the members who voted on this issue, who believe that this was an issue best put forward for the voters to decide. 
Uh, they wanted a, a constitutional amendment. The constitutional amendment takes more vote, uh, votes, and they just couldn't muster uh, the, the votes to do that. And I think once the House uh, saw what they did, the leadership in the House said, well, it's no need for us to put forward this, this, this idea, this concept, this resolution, because it's not going to prevail in the Senate. Even though with the bill that was still out there for sports betting would, um, would not have needed the, it only needed a simple majority, not the two-thirds for a, an amendment. And that the tactic this year included getting former Supreme Court Justice Harold Melton to weigh in, and his legal view was that sports betting did not, not need a constitutional amendment. And the push for sports betting seemed to gain steam right after that. It didn't work, though. It, it certainly did not. And unfortunately, we had a number of at least the Senate members who disagreed with the uh, former uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, Melton uh, uh, opinion. And, uh, you know, quite frankly, we just had those who believed that this uh, proposition was best put forward on the ballot uh, so that the voters could decide. I, I, I agree with uh, Judge Melton. I, I don't believe we needed a constitutional amendment uh, for online sports betting, uh, but the will of the majority of the senators who voted on this uh, contradicted my belief. Let's talk about the other part of the tactic, and that was going through higher education, mm -hmm. So, uh, because the money would go to the uh, Georgia Lottery for Education. That is correct. Uh, in as much as it wasn't going to be a constitutional amendment, it would have to be administered by the Georgia Lottery and therefore would have to go to the Hope Scholarship and, and, and uh, dealt with what the provisions of the Hope Scholarship presently uh, exists. Yeah, and there, were, there was more talk about the Hope Scholarship this year mm -hmm. in this past few weeks, more talk about pre-K, mm -hmm. getting that money. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, it just seemed like it was moving. Yeah, and, it, and it's disappointing that we find ourselves in this posture at this time. Uh, you know, I hope springs eternal. I, I would hope that we can come up with a solution because there's so much good that can be done with the resources that uh, online sports betting and other forms of gambling can create. Talk about some of that. Well, I will tell you, one of the things uh, that I'd like to see uh, with those who gamble anyway, uh, there's not enough resource. When you gamble out of state, those resources go out of state or in some cases out of this country. Uh, there are resources uh, that could go to pre-K and uh, certainly for those who can't afford to go to school, needs-based uh, uh, funding, for instance. But there's also uh, funding that would allow for those who have addictions and the like. If, you, if you're gambling out of state, those we can't service those folks who are in Georgia. So I always say, if we're going to do it, I would rather it be administered by Georgians in Georgia for the benefit of Georgians. Yeah, and let's talk about that. So that one, one of the big arguments is that the uh, gambling addiction that would come up uh, I know in other states you'll see on the screen that there's money that is set aside for that, right? That, that is, would have been part of it. That's, that would have been part of it. If you go out to another state and gamble and you have an addiction, uh, it's unlikely that they're going to be able to dedicate their resources to you as a, a resident of another state. We would have assured that there would be resources available for that purpose. And the other big issues have, have to do with crime and bringing in things that... Uh, people don't feel would be beneficial to the state, that would hurt the state. Well, you know, Donna, I, I've seen reports that contradict the fact that uh, gambling necessarily uh, brings uh, crime and an uh, unseedy element. I, I've been uh, had the opportunity to uh, visit other areas where they have, in fact, uh, implemented casino gambling, and the what it has done is just the opposite in, in, in most cases. In fact, uh, what leads more to crime is not not having a lot of economic opportunities, jobs, and, and businesses. And what this industry does is bring a lot of jobs, a lot of economic opportunities. Okay. You, anything you think going to be tacked on anything else, or is it? You know, this issue yeah. is, is, is a tough one. And uh, like I said, hope springs eternal. <laughs> I'd love to see uh, us get this through the finish line. Okay. Well, thank you for coming on the show to talk about it. Good to be here with you. That does it for lawmakers today. We'll be back tomorrow for day 30. Good night.